people around the world are facing severe challenges to food because of war. We won't be able to support the families who currently don't have access to food because of conflict, because they've lost their lands, they've lost their homes, and they've been displaced. The war has affected us. Our house was destroyed. We are now rebuilding it. Our living situation is very difficult. We are poor, we have no income, and we are only living on the assistance of the organization. These are ordinary people whose lives have been destroyed from conflict. Maybe it is different from other countries. In Afghanistan, every time, people just work for food and they just want to find food for eating. And they don't think to another thing. They just think how to find food and how to uh, fill up and how to bring food for their children and for their wives. Innocent people who didn't choose where they are born and are now suffering without basic needs like shelter and food. What we need is the international community not to turn away. There's a lot going on in the world, and so it's easy to say that's just one more challenge with another group of people who are suffering from insurgents, and it's not my problem. If there is a child, a mother, who cannot feed a child, a child who is going hungry, that's our problem. When I'm hungry, I can't concentrate on the teacher's explanation. I wish that the war and famine ends. Twenty twenty one has been a tumultuous year for the people of Afghanistan. It is the worst drought in thirty years. Conflict has raged across the country before August, displacing over 600,000 people. And since August, we have an economic freefall. This is manifesting in almost 23 million people across the country, unable to get a decent plate of food every single day. Today, we're facing into a harsh winter in Afghanistan. And many of the people I have met right across the country they tell me they are terrified for the winter because as food prices have gone up, as fuel prices have gone up, and as jobs have disappeared, they don't know how they're going to get through the winter. WFP is here on the ground, scaling up our operations. I have an incredible team behind me who are reaching the most remotest parts of Afghanistan before the snow comes and blocks off these communities. We need your help. I need your help today as we try to avert a humanitarian catastrophe here in Afghanistan. Welcome to Better Food, Better World. I'm Elizabeth Nyamayaro. In this episode, we will learn how and why conflict is one of the leading causes of global hunger from people who have seen this firsthand. We will take you to Afghanistan, which is on the brink of a catastrophic humanitarian crisis, which has been compounded by a severe drought, economic crisis, and insecurity. War over the years has killed tens of thousands of innocent civilians in Afghanistan. Tragically, hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of innocent Afghans are now at the risk of dying in this new war of hunger without a single shot fired. Afghanistan is only one of many countries facing a humanitarian crisis in the middle of unrest. Highlighted because of the global pandemic, we recognize that no matter how difficult our own personal experiences are, they are parts of the world that have been impacted in a lot more ways outside of our own communities. Valerie Guneri is the Assistant Executive Director of the United Nations World Food Program. She leads the agency's policies that aim to end hunger and feed children, empower women, and build resilient food systems. She sees firsthand how communities suffer from conflict. 
even before the pandemic, we were seeing hunger on the rise for the first time in, in several decades. And now with the combination of conflict, of the climate crisis and of COVID, we're seeing hunger really at record levels. So 811 million people who go to bed hungry every night. We've got 270 million people suffering from severe acute hunger. So we're very concerned with this rise in, in hunger, and we're very motivated to do everything that we can to get the world back on track towards zero hunger, which is the sustainable development goal that we're working with governments to achieve. Food prices can be quite volatile. And what we see is that food prices rise when there is a shortfall. I mean, it's simple supply and demand economics. And in that context, conflict is a big driver of hunger broadly, but also of price spikes. Conflict drives people off their land. It separates people from their jobs and from their livelihoods. People often have to abandon their crops as they flee with nothing more than the clothes on their back and may find themselves in camps where they're unable to access their land or to access any land in which to produce. Conflict directly affects food production when people are displaced. Conflict can also affect food production if there are deliberate attempts made to destroy the means of, of production, then there too, people are not able to produce. And conflict can also block people from being able to access the market. So in a range of different ways, conflict affects access to food and can drive prices up so that even if people can get to the food, they can't afford to buy it. Actually, that's a really interesting talking point as well, because most people aren't often aware that conflict is one of the leading cause of global hunger. And I was actually going to ask you to take us behind the scenes and help us understand the link between peace and food. Conflict and hunger, peace and food, security, I mean, these are really inextricably linked. We know that conflict drives hunger through displacements, but we know that hunger also can have an impact on conflict if people are unable to feed themselves and feed their families, then they have to take action in order to change that. And some of that action might be migrating uh, to other areas, which may put them in contact with other populations. It may lead to strained access to resources, maybe water rights. We see problems between farmers and herders herders that erupt when grazing land is expands into previously farming areas. So in all of these areas, we can see hunger driving conflict at a local level, and occasionally it can erupt into a, a global level. And, and we've seen that when there have been riots, for instance, linked to severe food price spikes. So these two issues need to be considered alongside each other and they need to be addressed. We know as WFP that 60 percent of the hungry poor live in countries affected by conflict and eight out of 10 of the world's worst food crises are driven by conflict and insecurity. So you can't separate the two and we can't end hunger without addressing the issue of conflict and building peace. Earlier, we had a powerful message from Mary Ellen Magroti, the World Food Program Country Director of Afghanistan, describing the potential of a humanitarian catastrophe while visiting the food offices in Faisabad and Kunduz in the northeastern part of the country, she's on the road hearing directly from those in need. As she travels in an armored vehicle, the radio and phones and the security clipping in the background. She's busy making sure 23 million people in Afghanistan have enough food to survive. Have they ever seen it this difficult in Afghanistan? No, 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 no. This, is the first, this is the first time because of the economic situation, no work. So, Mary Ellen, you have to make some enormous decisions. How do you even prioritize? What we're trying to do is stem an escalating crisis 
on the other side, we do need solutions that will resuscitate the economy. Because at the end of the day, the economy is the lifeblood and the oxygen of a country. And if the economy is not soon resuscitated, we will meet many more families, many more women and men who have lost their jobs, who will join the queues for humanitarian assistance. But what I'm especially struck by now when I'm out and talking to people is the impact that the economic crisis is having on women, uh, particularly, because many of them now are they're not allowed to work. They've lost their jobs, and it's taking a devastating toll on them because now you have these extremely talented, bright people who are not contributing to what they feel to their right to contribute to their society and instead are at home. And I find it extremely sad, but also devastating. And of course, it's having a huge impact on household food insecurity for these people, because many are female headed households. Decades of war in Afghanistan means that Afghanistan has the highest proportion of widows in the world because of the conflict. Some of them are young widows, recently widowed. Some of them are old widows. All of them have families that they are trying to raise. They have, to some extent, been able to find work before, but this new economic crisis, but also the crisis around women's rights and, and women's ability to work outside the home are having a, a devastating impact. I've just come from meeting a crowd of women who told me that they're selling their household items to put food on the table. How do you prioritize when you're up against a situation like that? As a woman leader myself, it's heartbreaking to meet just women who want to work and they're still here in Afghanistan. For me, it's probably only a platitude to say, keep strong and we will keep advocating. But I can never imagine what it is to walk in their shoes at the moment. To have your dreams and your aspirations and your ambitions just wrenched from you in the spoils of war. Because it's always the innocent who are caught up in conflict. Women and children and men suffer heavily from consequences out of their own hands. Loss of income, gender-based violence, lack of access to health services, education and water and sanitation. This take no time to destroy and yet decades to rebuild. <sighs> Mary Ellen, what is your message for the international community? I humbly ask them really to... Don't leave with those defining stereotypes, images of Afghanistan as being about the war and those pictures at the airport and tens of thousands of people leaving. Think about just ordinary people here, 40 million people, just ordinary people like you and I, who just want to have a life where we can bring up our families and be able to put food on the table, have a job, have the joys of living, go through the sadnesses of living. I met a man yesterday, he said he's lived through 19 governments, and he said this is the worst he's ever seen it. I said, but you must be happy that the war is over for now. He said, I don't know. He said, I think I preferred the war to the hunger we are now facing. That's a devastating statement to hear. I think these people have lived with enough war and enough brutality and enough conflict. I do hope the international community can be somewhat pragmatic I understand the complexities, the concerns, but somehow pragmatic and see if there's a way to help the country resuscitate the economy without directly supporting those in power and not recognizing them or giving them legitimacy. There are ways to be innovative to be able to protect people. This is Wings of Love from Jordan artist Zaina Bahoum. As an award-winning opera singer who will release her first pop album of the same name in 2022, Zaina is also a World Food Program advocate and has visited the Zatari refugee camp, where she saw families receiving support from World Food Program. This is such a beautiful song, Zaina. Tell me the inspiration behind it. Thank you very much. I started writing this song just a year before the pandemic when they first announced the global lockdown. 
is where the lyrics just started flowing and made me think about what the world's going through, what it will be going through, and how, speaking of unity and the power of unity, will probably be the only solution going forward because I just basically saw the world almost collapse in front of me. I always believed in thinking positively and having a positive approach to things. I hope that those who will hear the lyrics would be happier, be uplifted, believe in a better tomorrow because the words speak of that, a better tomorrow, a better world for everyone. But it will only happen if we love each other. And if we love each other, we would have unity. And through unity, we would have a better tomorrow and a better world. I feel very uplifted. Yeah, I'm glad. (laughs) I'm glad it made you feel that way. It's a beautiful song. And again, I think with love, we can achieve so much more in this world. Absolutely. I really do believe that with love, we can achieve so much. We can really achieve anything because also without love, it is very hard to feel compassion and to be giving and to support and to make a difference. Or to end conflict. What sits at the heart of conflict is hatred. And if we're only able to replace that with love, then that would solve that. And then when we solve conflict, that would also address global hunger because then there's no forced migration and people aren't fighting over food and food isn't being used as a tool to start wars. Yeah. So it seems like a very simple song, but it's a very profound song. And the meaning behind it is exactly what is needed in our world today. We just need more love, more understanding, more compassion. And I think we can achieve so much more as one human family. The opening of the song is flying without a fear for a better tomorrow. Also not having fear to also try to make a difference because some people also are afraid of approaching a particular problem and to find a solution, afraid of the consequences. But if you really want to make a real change, uh, and I always believe that as a human being, I exist on this planet to make a difference. And I will leave this planet leaving something behind. If I know that I left having made a difference, then I'll be content. At least I hope so. This reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from Nelson Mandela. He says, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. And I think that's so powerful. And there's your song about love right there. Oh, wow. That's very powerful. And there's your song. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Can you tell me about your childhood and how food played a part in your growing up? My journey started with art and music at eight years old. It was all around the house and guided me through my childhood growth and inspiration throughout my adulthood as well. At home, we were always taught how to appreciate our blessings, mainly the food set at our table every day, where my parents constantly reminded us that so many around the world do not have a fraction of that blessing. My mother is an environmental sociologist, so um, she also consistently made us aware of the nutritious factors of food and sanitation, as well as avoiding waste. She was always an inspiration around the house. I'm so curious that your table was always full of food. What was your favorite food growing up? I was a weird child. (laughs) So I didn't like candy or anything bad for children. Basically sugar-based foods I wasn't crazy about. I loved vegetables. And my favorite food, I don't know, I didn't really have a favorite food, but I loved green onions. I used to munch on green onions, funny enough. (laughs) So yeah, there you have it. I think that's also something that happens, right? When you have access to fresh food, which again, for most people, it's not a reality. Most people live so far away from the source of their food and they can't access healthy, fresh, nutritious food. It's pretty lovely childhood that you had. (laughs) So let's shift on to much more serious things. We know that conflict is one of the leading cause of global hunger What has been your personal experience with regards to conflict and hunger in your region? In our part of the world, we've been witnessing this for years and the consequences are heartbreaking. I was recently able to witness a situation of displaced people upon a visit with the World Food Program at the Zatari camp. 
as well as visit families, talk to the members of the family, listen to their stories, what brought them here in detail. And it was uh, very difficult to listen to them talk about it, talk about their suffering. And clearly the reasoning behind their displacement is, is not easy to talk about for them. But also witnessing the impact of what the WFP has built there is incredible. We visited the outlets at the camp that are supported by the WFP that provide security through the iris scan and the blockchain systems, which was uh, really great to see. I also saw them shopping around the outlets, putting the bakery in the supermarket. Visiting the families where they lived was, I think, for me, the most difficult part. But it was a very big eye opener. It makes one think, though, about the fact that we perhaps as individuals and entities do not have any coercive power over what leads to conflict-driven hunger as we often arrive at the consequence and can only assist in relieving the extremity of the result rather than be able to eliminate it. But what is slightly comforting at the end of the day is the fact that we can do something about it by lending a helping hand through talking to those who are suffering, making them feel like they're not alone, and um, clearly through providing food security, as the WFP does. For the listeners who are not aware, Zatari Camp is actually the world's largest camp for Syrian refugees in Jordan. And I can only imagine I haven't been just hearing your story. It is also heartbreaking because there's also women and children there, which I'm sure was very hard for you. You know, as somebody who's advocating for gender equality, I'm sure that was very difficult. It was very difficult to see. There are some success stories, refugees working on their skills. Some of them have talent that they're exploring and they're developing. Some of them also uh, have dreams, just like any other person in the world, and dream to be someone one day, to be successful in what they do. I actually met a photographer after my visit to the Zatari camp. We met on social media because he saw a post that I posted after my visit there. And we connected and he told me about his dream to become a photographer, an international photographer. And it was really nice to listen to his story and see his work. And I'm sure there's so many like him uh, who have dreams and are pursuing them. And, and that's pretty amazing to see as well come out of the camp. Zayna's story describes how hope can lead to success. People who have lived through conflict can have the opportunity to pursue their dreams we can all do better to make those dreams a reality. As the song goes, wings of love will carry us to where we need to go. Zaina, what does better food, better world mean to you? To me, better food, better world means food is life. Without the will to provide better food for our fellow humans who are in dire need of it, we will not have a better world and will only lose life. The life of those around us practically withers away day in and day out as we speak. So working towards protecting our oceans, forests, and soil, as well as minimizing the effects of pollution is also really important and protecting the quality of the food resources available to us now and in the future so that we do not face the scarcity of its supply. That's what it means to me. Better food, better world. And thank you, Mary Ellen, to you and your team for everything that you're doing in Afghanistan. What is your wish for a better food, better world? We need to stop the wars, silence the guns so that countries can at least do things for themselves without fleeing violence all the time. And then together as a global community, help many of these countries on the front line of climate change to be able to adapt in a way so that they can withstand climate change and it doesn't bring them to the absolute brink of survival and desperation. I know that when we talk about issues of conflict and war and global hunger, it can feel rather daunting and overwhelming because the task is enormous and it's also easy as an ordinary citizen to feel disempowered because you feel like, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. How can I end a conflict? But here's the thing. Whilst we can't silence the guns, 
the one thing that we can't do is remain silent about the things that matter. Martin Luther King once said that the world begins to die the moment we remain silent about the things that matter. Ending conflict matters. Ending global hunger matters. And it's all up to all of us to play our individual part by raising our voice, advocating for change, and speaking truth to power and holding those in power accountable and making sure that they end the conflict that is devastating our world today. And so my wish for Better Food, Better World is that we recognize our own agency and we recognize that we can all be part of ending conflict and ending global hunger. Use your social media platform to advocate. Volunteer for an NGO working on the front lines of ending conflict and global hunger. Donate if you can, but the one thing that you can't do is to remain silent about the things that matter. Thank you so much for listening and see you next time. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, please do so using the hashtag BetterFood, Better World. Better